Should Christians celebrate Halloween? Absolutely, because Halloween and the days that follow are Christian festivals. Death is on our mind in these days. And that's a good thing for Christians to think about. Now, what about ghosts? Most of the time, those kind of supernatural experiences are attributed to one of two things. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today we're going to do an episode on Halloween. It's coming up, not just Halloween, but it's also All Saints Day, All Souls Day the next day in some faith traditions. So anyways, we're going to get into Halloween. We're going to get into what is the Christian response to Halloween? Should your kids trick or treat? Most people will say, yeah, of course, duh. What about the goblins and the gremlins and the witches and the ghosts? Are ghosts real? Do ghosts exist? What does that mean? Should we interact with ghosts? Uh, What does it mean that some Christian traditions teach purgatory? And purgatory has a lot to do with All Souls Day because in the Catholic tradition, you pray for the dead. What does this all mean? We're going to break it down, myths, questions, and misconceptions about Halloween. And we're going to have on the very popular Father Ambrose Christ. Father Ambrose was on before talking about angels and demons and his work as an exorcist. But now we're going to talk all things Halloween. Do you ever wonder where your meat comes from in the grocery store? Did you know that even if it says product of the USA, it might be from another country entirely? And are you ever unhappy with the quality of your meat or chicken at the grocery store? Well, I certainly have been, and that's why my husband and I were delighted to discover Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers is the number one meat, poultry, and seafood company in America. Good Ranchers sources directly from American ranchers, ranchers across this country who are raising the best beef, the best pork, and the best poultry to send directly to you. So check out goodranchers.com today. It's where I've been getting my meat. I've been getting my poultry. It's amazing. It's the best thing. You're not going to find meat of this quality in the grocery store. And at goodranchers.com, you can use the code LILA at checkout for free express shipping, as well as $30 off your order. That's goodranchers.com. And you can use the code LILA at checkout for $30 off your order, as well as free express shipping. Father Ambrose, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. Thanks for having me back, Lila. Your last episode, you you were a huge hit. I mean, <laughs> everyone everyone loved that the episode that you did on angels and demons. Well, I think the topic is really attractive. People have a lot of questions about that. And, you know, it's all for God's glory, Lila. So Amen. Amen. Well, we loved people wanted you back, and there are lots of questions about faith and spirituality mm. we get on the channel. And so who better to talk about Halloween (laughs) than you. Um, We're going to talk about Halloween. We're going to talk about All Souls Day, All Saints Mm -hmm. Day, which are the traditional Christian holidays separate from Halloween, but connected. Yes. And we're going to talk about, let's see, ghosts. Okay. Does that sound good? And purgatory. We'll get into that and wherever else we go. Fantastic. So thank you again. Now, how have you been since we last had you on the show? Well, God is good. And uh, my confers and I are, are trying to do all we can to build up the kingdom of Christ here on earth. So a lot of wonderful projects underway in the Midwest, in Springfield, Illinois, our new priory there, of course, at the Abbey, lots of great things happening all the time. So thank you for asking. Yeah. And you just launched a a new program as well, I heard. Yes. A little commercial, huh? Thanks, Lila. So the Evermode Institute, St. Evermode is a saint of our Norbertine order, and we're, we're launching a catechetical program of formation to teach the faith to different demographics, Catholic school teachers and catechists and parishes and parents. So kind of bolstering the full and um, orthodox Catholic identity amongst the people who uh, might be missing that and need to have that. Wonderful. Wonderful. I look forward to learning more about it. Okay. So Halloween. Okay. Should Christians celebrate Halloween? Absolutely. Because Halloween and the days that follow are Christian festivals. This is a Christian, a Catholic Christian series of three days. Halloween, of course, you probably know this, Lila, the the word comes from the Old English, um, All Hallows' Eve, All Hallows' Eve, Halloween, and it's the Eve of All Saints' Day, Hallows' Day, All Hallows' is All Saints'. So it's the vigil of the great solemnity of All Saints, and that's why we have it at all, because in, in Catholic Christian life, we mark these biggest and holiest days of the year with a vigil and sometimes with preparation even before the vigil. So this is the eve of a great solemnity, which is a holy day of obligation for Catholics now and a great festival throughout the universal church, 
All Saints Day. Now, some people say that we took a pagan holiday and we made it into a Christian holiday. Is there any truth to that? There's also these accusations about Christmas. Yes. So, no, I mean, it's easy It's easy for people who hate Christ and his church to try to make these associations, which might be founded in some kind of um, similarities or certainly cultural um, the, the cultural bleed from one group of people to another is real. But no, it's not it, – it would be an oversimplification and also wrong to say that Christianity simply took pagan festivals and put this veneer of faith on top of them. It That's way too simple and that's not exactly what happened. So in the case of Halloween, it's even farther from the truth. The late 19th century, early 20th century accusations about – uh, about Halloween being a pagan thing that was somehow baptized by Roman Catholics is just that was just kind of um, Protestant vitriol against um, against Catholics. You know, our our, our country, the, the United States, was founded as a Protestant Christian nation, and there was always a real fear and even um, mistrust and sometimes a real kind of persecution of, uh, against the Catholic Christians. So when all of these English and Irish and Belgian and Dutch immigrants were coming, especially at the end of the 19th century. They brought with them all of their Catholic customs, including the things surrounding All Saints Day and All Souls Day and Halloween, the eve, the eve of those feasts. And the the most kind of anti-Catholic Protestants were like, whoa. <laughs> what are these what is this? trick or like, treaters more, doing? <laughs> more reason to um, – to put the smack, so, the so smack down on the Catholics. When those Catholic immigrants came to the United States in the late 20th or the late uh, 19th, 19th century, and, yes. and 20th century, did and you're, they kind of brought the tradition of All Souls, All, All Saints Eve, and then All Souls Day, All Saints Day. Yes. And so Halloween. So you're saying there's sort of this emergence of Halloween in the United States. What what did it look like then? Were they trick or treating? Well, so um, and what is trick or treating? Okay, it's good. How is that Christian? <laughs> okay, so I think two kind of two paths we can follow there, Lila. One, just the nature of Catholic festivity, Catholic festivals and the customs that go along with that, very culturally um, founded and particular to different parts of especially European culture. Mm -hmm. So many of the, um, we might say, cultural trappings of the way that Catholics celebrate festivals comes with them when they come to the new world. And there's certainly some of that with um, Halloween and All Souls Day and All Saints Day, All Saints Day, All Souls Day. So it's, it's perfectly normal across all of Catholic cultures to pray for the dead, to spend time in the cemetery on All Souls Day and to prepare for that on All Saints Day. So to be in those places where we have laid our beloved ones to rest, decorating their graves, bringing flowers, carrying candles, washing their tombstones. And uh, in some cultures, they would even spend the whole of November 2nd in the cemetery having a picnic praying for the dead, remembering with great fondness their their loved ones who are members of the church, right? Just so, because they've died there, they haven't, they haven't, they're, they're still members of the church and members of our family. So mm -hmm. so along with that comes these wonderful customs. You you mentioned trick-or-treating. In certain parts of European culture, on the the vigil, so the eve before All Saints Day, people would go asking door to door um, for little sweets and say, you know, I'll pray for your those who died in your family this last year if you'll give me a little sweet, you know, a little mm. soul cake they called that. Or so you give me a treat, and I will do this alms for you. I will pay this alms for your beloved dead. I'll say a prayer for them, and so that kind of door to door asking for gifts and exchanging prayers for those gifts mm. for the de dead. That's the Catholic. Uh, underpinning foundation of trick-or-treating. Those words trick-or-treating, I think that's a much more modern invention. So. Yeah, the trick word, I think some people are concerned it has to do with some sort of witchcraft or, you know, I've heard yes. people, you know, concerned, you know, Christians concerned and Catholics, but mostly, you know, evangelicals concerned that's like a, a cult reference. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, that's not where it comes from. That might be what people interpret it mm -hmm. to mean now. But the trick, as I understand, and I could be wrong about this, but as, as I understand that, the that English root of that is more about if the, a little bit of a play, you know, this is a the, the tomfoolery of Catholic festivity. You might think about Mardi Gras, for example, mm -hmm. or other times of the year when there's this wonderful partying in preparation for serious praying. Mm. And there's there's a fair amount of that also in the history of Halloween. So the trick is I'm going to play a little trick on you more like I'm going to um, 
I'm I'm going to um, make a fool of you or do something um, tongue in cheek. Steal your trash can. Something like that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> tongue in cheek kind of um, play a game on you um, if you don't give me your candy. give me the, the, the candy. Now, <laughs> again, it's all that in Catholic life. That's all. That's all in the context of people understand mm-hmm. that that's all on good fun. Yes, and also it's not about this overlay of weird neo paganism. So that part, yes. that's a very contemporary kind of layer of interpretation on Halloween. I want to get to different. that. I want to get to the ghouls and the goblins and the ghosts. Okay, because you know my neighborhood, for example, we walk down the street and there's like houses with these extremely scary, <laughs> you know, yes. figures. So I, I want to ask about that. But you said something really interesting. You said the tradition is connected to, you know, it goes back to prayers for the dead. Yes. And, you know, all – so November 1st is All Saints Day. November 2nd is All Souls Day. Correct. And the idea, especially on November 2nd, is you pray for the dead. Now, this is very controversial among some Christians yes. because, uh, you know, certainly the Orthodox and the Catholic Christians pray for the dead. Yes. And they ask for the prayers of the dead. Yes. But, you know, evangelicals and most mainly Protestants, you know, uh, Baptists, this is not acceptable. You know, then I think it goes back to um, verses in the Bible that say you should not, you know, against necromancy, you shall not interact with those who are dead, Mm -hmm. these prohibitions. So Mm -hmm. help us understand why praying for the dead is not only acceptable, but encouraged. Okay. And just before we we tease some of those Mm -hmm. threads out, the the beautiful... Um, Catholic wisdom of putting these festivals together is that we have we we understand understand ourselves to be what we call the church militant those who are still mm-hmm. struggling here below, mm-hmm. you know, working out our salvation, fear and trembling, as uh, Saint Paul says, undergoing our our time of testing and getting ready to enter into the kingdom when our life ends, right, and meeting our our judge and and please God, um, seeing him face to face. That's the church suffering, or rather the church militant here on earth. The church triumphant are all the saints in heaven, everybody who has arrived at the, the heavenly homeland. They're, they've won the victory through Christ. They have reached their destination. That's All Saints Day. We celebrate all of those saints, known and unknown, everybody who has entered heavenly glory and are waiting the resurrection of their bodies at the end of time. And then we have the church suffering. That's all of those souls who are still undergoing some purification, which is the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. There's an Orthodox version of that as well. The ancient church and the whole Christian church really until the time of the, of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, understood the, that there is this whole church universal, which is the living on earth, those living on earth, those awaiting their time of purification, and those rejoicing in heaven. That's the whole church. We're all members of the church. So these these days together, what we call um, Hallowtide, all Hallowtide, like Christmas tide or Easter tide, um, that you could even call it Hallowmas, mm. the the festival of the holy ones, is bringing all of those parts of those three parts of Christ's church together. Mm. And, and rejoicing in each other's goodness in the case of the saints and praying for those who are still undergoing purification. Okay, so your purgatory, that's a, that you're right. That's a controversial topic for non-Catholic or non, I would say non-apostolic Christians, those whose roots don't go back to the beginning of the Christian church. So the, with the Protestant Reformation, that there was a, a, a great deal of um, rethinking some of these very ancient, fifth by then, 1,500-year-old theological truths. So you're saying praying for the dead before the Reformation was a 1,500-year-old tradition? Oh, sure. And even before that, the 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 Jews just before the time of our Lord's coming, and the, we, we read about this in the b- books of Maccabees, um, praying for the dead is, is also mm-hmm. a Jewish custom. So that that becomes part of the Christian life too because we understand that death – is not the end of our relationship with one another. And um, our Lord himself says that, you know, God, the, the father, of the God, God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, he's not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. Well, when our Lord said those words, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had already passed through the veil to the other side. And our Lord is saying that they are still alive. They're alive. And so we have a relationship with them. Um, and so that... Can you talk to them? When you say they have a relationship with them, I know some people that their grandparent has passed and they really feel 
like their mm. grandparent is watching over mm. them. It mm. feels tangible to them. Mm. Um, these are people of faith, you know, they have a deep connection. So when you say, but you know, it's hard to know, is this real? Is that really happening? Or is the Lord just giving them, you know, comfort that they are with him in heaven or, or something of that kind? Yes. What does it mean to have a relationship with the dead? Well, I think that teasing out what exactly is going on there in that individual mm -hmm. Christian's experience of that consoling um, kind of communication with those whom we love who have died, mm -hmm. what exactly is going on there? It could be something emotional. It could be something deeply spiritual and real. It could be that God really is giving the consoling grace of knowing that this person is with me in some mysterious way and hears me. Uh, and of course they can if God permits them to. So that relationship and that communication, just like I can ask you to pray for me, so too, God forbid you should go before me in death, I can ask you to pray for me mm. from there too. We are, we are all members of Christ's mystical body and death does not somehow break our relationships with one another. So of course, there's a veil between those two worlds, isn't there? And it's only rarely and by God's special favor that we can peer through the veil or that there's some more tangible kind of experience of the communication through that veil of life into death. But certainly the, the relationships are real and the intercessory power of the saints is very real. Just like if I ask you to pray for me because I have some intention on my heart that I need help with, as fellow Christians and you pray to God for me or for my intention, that that might be exactly what God wanted to help affect whatever the answer to that prayer is. So too, if you were to go before me in death and I ask that for you, why wouldn't you want to pray for me from there as well, right? So all of that is quite mysterious, but the relationships are real. That's mm -hmm. the point. So what, what about this uh, prohibition against uh, engaging the dead? Yeah, we, we don't want to, so divination, and, and using in a kind of uh, more occult way, I need to know the answer to this question, you know, like reading the, reading the tea leaves or, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a kind of um, attempt to manipulate those relationships for my benefit or for my particular selfish aims. Uh, th that's, uh, that's what the Lord is, is prohibiting. And also you have to remember that the time of those prohibitions from the old covenant is the Lord is gradually leading his people out of real paganism, the, the, the worship of demons and idols and uh, a kind of um, misunderstanding about where the dead feature into that world. It's a, it, the Lord needs us to be far, far away from what is real paganism, you know, with all of its cultural trappings and all of its errors and all of its demons. And so, so that he's that, that beautiful gradual um, pulling of his people out of that ancient pagan demonic world and into the possibility for the incarnation and the light of the gospel. And so those prohibitions are feature par into part of that um, drawing of his people out of darkness into light. So the prohibition biblically isn't against asking for the prayers of the dead or praying for the dead. Right. Instead, it's against seeking answers from the dead as if it's an oracle or exactly. some special spirit that exactly. will help you with your life. That's exactly in, right. In telling you what to do. That's exactly right. Which is also why in the current day and age, that whole world of consulting a psychic, mm. that's necromancy. Mm. I mean, that's what that is. So then what is the biblical evidence? Is there any biblical evidence, you know, stories in the Bible or passages that show prayer for the dead yes. or prayer, asking the prayer of the dead? I would invite everybody to read the second book of Maccabees. So uh, sadly, in, the, in those awful uh, days of the division of the Christian church in the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation, that, that period, there was an attempt... And of course, I'm giving a very Catholic reading of that history, as you would understand. I might I, expect and it. I yeah. hope, and I hope your friends yeah. would understand that too. The, all of those, uh, what were then understood to be scriptural, uh, canonical books of the scriptures, including the letter of James and also the letters to the Maccabees, which some Christian Bibles, non-Catholic Christian Bibles now call apocrypha. Mm -hmm. Those are the places where some of those most um, contested doctrines are to be found mm. in, the, in the case of the letter of James 
Is that why they were remo- they that's, were removed? That's why we would understand that to be that's why they were removed because there's something here that the Protestant reformers just don't like theologically. So take out those books of the scriptures that don't conform to this this reformed theology. And included in that would be the second book of Maccabees where it's very obvious that prayer for the dead is efficacious and that the Lord – it's pleasing to the Lord and it's part of the life of what will become his church. So why were the Protestant reformers against the teaching on prayer for the dead? It's a really good question, Lila. The, I would say the root of all – all of the theolo- the deepest theological divisions from that period are philosophical mm. in nature first. So in this case, the, the Reformed theology and the, the Protestant theology flows out of a post-enlightenment philosophical world where the individual takes primacy that, and, and this, this complicated um, uh, rejection of the material world outside of us as a sign of God's goodness and the way that we come to know the truth by looking at the things around us. Uh, You might remember Descartes said famously, I think, therefore I am. Somehow this uh, turning into the the experience of the, the psychological, we might say, experience of the individual from my own interiority as the place from which I assess truth or falsehood. That's a Copernican revolution in philosophy, and it's erroneous in many, many ways, not in all ways, but in many ways. And so... What is Copernican revolution? And so just, just in the same way, <laughs> yes, just in the same way that, that with Copernicus, mm. the, the, the scientific revolution, that the earth is the center of the universe and everything revolves around it, mm. and, and versus the sun being the center of at least our, our, our um, solar system and everything revolves around it. That was a revolution in science. Mm. So too in philosophy, there was that kind of radical revolution that came with the primacy of the individual. And there's a lot more to be said about that philosophically, but not to belabor the point in philosophy. When I am the center of my judgments about the truth of anything around me or within me, which is what that philosophical error leads to, then things get really murky as far as theological points, metaphysical points, truths that depend upon the material universe being the first place that we come to know what is true and then have revelation to aid us in that and to assist us with those truths that we can't know by natural reason alone. So um, that's a long way of answering your question, probably not a very clear way of answering your question, but there's some serious philosophical error at the root of what became the errors of Protestantism. So was it a combination then of the gripes and some of them understandable gripes about uh, corrupt church leaders in the Catholic Church? And so there was a lack of trust in the leadership of the church Mm -hmm. connected with this philosophical movement of I am the center of the universe in Mm -hmm. terms of deciding morality or uh, objectivity around me and understanding, you know, what is right and what is wrong. And that combination led to perhaps the Reformation. Yes, that's a that's a I think a, a fair way of bringing all of those threads together that contributed to this disaster. And it really was a disaster. It is a disaster. You know, our Lord wants us to be one. He prayed mm-hmm. for that at the the night before he died. You know, Father, they might be one as I am in you and you are in me, that they might be one in us. You know, and we're still waiting for that, right? And praying for that. Uh yes, there when you look at the scandal of Christian believers who don't live their life well or with the integrity that is required of us, including church leaders, including mm-hmm. priests and bishops and even popes through history, where there's real scandal in the way that they represent the Catholic mm-hmm. Christian life, then of course that's going to cause people to say, how can I trust you? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a real, it's a problem for each of us, isn't it? That when my life and my words don't conform with what I proclaim to believe what I profess, then that might be a scandal to someone who says, well, why should I believe what you believe? Look at how you live your life. So that's part of the call to holiness, right? That we, we, we need our lives to, with Christ's help and with the grace that comes from Almighty God, live our lives in conformity with these truths. And you're right, there were periods in, in the history of the, of the church where that wasn't so... There wasn't always that kind of integrity. 
there's nothing better than starting a fall morning with a cup of the most delicious gourmet organic hot coffee. And that's why I love Seven Weeks Coffee. SevenWeeksCoffee.com is a gourmet, organic, and delicious coffee company that is not only making the best and ethically sourced coffee, but it is also America's pro-life coffee company. So when you order from SevenWeeksCoffee.com, 10% of the money that you spend on that site for that delicious coffee goes directly to pro-life pregnancy centers that are helping moms and babies. So check out sevenweekscoffee.com, order some coffee, you can even become a subscriber, and 10% of all of what you spend will go directly to fuel the pro-life movement. That's sevenweekscoffee.com and you can use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. So back to the Reformation, you know, one of the, as I understand Martin Luther's particular grievances, you know, one of the you know, the lead reformers at the time who ended up rejecting, I, I understand there was a lot of uh, work to try to reconcile with Martin Luther, like, mm -hmm. let's figure this out and reform the Catholic Church, don't separate from the church. Mm -hmm. But under, he ended up going his own way. Um, but one of his concerns was indulgences. Yes. It was this idea, back to trick-or-treat, of saying, if you give me something, you know, I will um, get a prayer or I will say a prayer. Yes. This kind of uh, trading of graces. Yes. yes. Uh, trading for prayers, trading for graces. Yeah. So the, you're right. That's the, historically the, the doctrine of indulgences was one of the grievances that, that eventually drove poor Martin Luther out of the church. At least he says that that was one of them. And uh, again, just because there are some abuses of the uh, discipline surrounding some of these truths like the value of indulgences or prayer for the dead, just because that was abused in some places or times doesn't mean that the doctrine isn't true. Mm. So he threw the baby out with the bathwater, but there's there's still a baby in, who needs to be in the bathwater. There's still <laughs> a baby there, and that is the, the doctrine of the prayers mm. for the dead and the value of indulgences. So the church still teaches this just like in the second book of Maccabees where Prayers for the dead uh, can help them, can help the dead, and it's a gift for the the whole body of believers. So too, the church now believes that we can exchange these spiritual goods with one another and help one another, all because the whole treasure house of merit is stored up in the hands of the church that Christ himself established. Yeah. When our Lord said to St. Peter, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven in St. Matthew's gospel. There's so much that goes along with that, not just about the forgiveness mm -hmm. of sins and the sacramental order that touches on confession, but also with this wonderful treasury, the storehouse of grace that's in the hands of the church of Christ here on earth uh, and in the in the, in the the the, the hands, as it were, of that institution which Christ established, that is the Catholic Church. So we can, we can exchange these spiritual goods with one another. And so a Catholic believer can ask for a mass to be offered for the soul of their loved one who just died. And the value, the merit, the grace that comes along with that offering of the holy sacrifice of the mass, we believe the church can determine can be applied to that soul. That's what indulgences mm -hmm. are. It's this wonderful exchange of these spiritual goods and uh, about helping those who still have some um, penalties to pay. We call them the, the the temporal punishment due to sin. This is again we're deep in we're deep in the in the tall grass of Catholic theology here. It's good. These are where the disagreements and it's, the it's where it happens. That's are. right. That 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 we can help alleviate the temporal punishment due to mm -hmm. sin in another member of the body of Christ who is still paying that off in purgatory. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. There's so, a lot, and, yes. and I want to get to the to the dressing up as goblins <laughs> for, for Halloween. Okay. Um, you know, should you dress up as a goblin? We're going to be asking you that soon. Um, but you were on purgatory right now, mm -hmm. and you just said something. You said they're 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 paying the temporal punishment price, punishment due to sin due to yeah. sin, and you can help other people pay that price. Break that down because okay. if I'm, you know, I, as you know, I was raised uh, evangelical Protestant. I've got many friends and the understanding there is Jesus Christ's blood is, covers us all. Yes. And I know you agree with that, but we don't need to, 
you know, do any work, especially after death, goodness, you know, life is hard enough, but uh, to earn that salvation, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ's death on the cross is mm -hmm. more than enough. And the idea that we have to do work after death or that other people have to do work for us after death, you know, uh, I think is against that sensibility of yes. the, the, this is not what we understand the Bible to teach yes. on the power of Jesus's death and death. Yes. His, his, his victory over sin and death mm -hmm. is all sufficient and complete in the shedding of his blood on the cross. That's absolutely true that, that every, every single ounce, if you could measure it out like that, of salvation and the payment of the penalties due to our sin, the eternal payments due, the eternal, eternal pen, punishment due to our sin is paid by Christ on the cross. Absolutely. That's without doubt true. There, um, let, me, let me think of an, an example to see if I can help everybody to understand this a little bit. If I'm playing baseball in my backyard and I hit a ball through my neighbor's window I break the window. I go next door as a little boy and I ask the forgiveness of the neighbor whose window I just broke. And he says, of course I forgive you. That's an accident. You know, it happens. Nevertheless, someone has to pay to replace the window. So I'm going to go mow his lawn for the rest of the summer, whatever it is, right? And I mow the lawn and then he's like, okay, good. You paid off the penalty due to that infraction against this, this world of justice. You just, so you paid back that penalty, even though I already forgave you. There's something like that that's a – all anal analogies limp, but that's, you know, when, when I commit – when we commit grave sin that offends Almighty God after our baptism, after we've been saved, washed in the blood of the, of the Lamb, of course, we ask for forgiveness and Christ forgives us. That's the beauty of the sacramental order of the church as well. We even have a sacrament that makes us know, helps us to know that that happened. We're restored to sanctifying grace. But there is – the window's still broken and my prayers, my sacrifices, the sufferings that come along with this human life, eventually the old age and infirmity, all of that is what pays off the replacement of the window. But what if my brother said, you know what? You've got other things to do this summer. You can't mow the lawn. I'll mow the lawn for you. He mows the lawn. He pays back the actual material cost of the window. So too, we Christians can do that. You know what? You're a busy wife and mother. You have a family. How about somebody else in the communion of Christ, in the body of Christ? How about I, I fast on Friday for your intentions? Mm -hmm. And my fasting is Thank helping. Thank you. <laughs> you know, something like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. Th there's this exchange of spiritual goods. So because maybe you don't have the wherewithal or I don't have the wherewithal mm -hmm. to do whatever that is. We, we exchange these spiritual goods. We are united in the body of Christ. And purgatory is mm -hmm. everything about that, about that exchange of spiritual goods. And indulgences are also that, the, mm -hmm. the ebb and flow of this treasure throughout the whole mystical mm -hmm. body. It's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. and, and to throw that baby out with the bathwater, I think we lose a lot. I think that there's a lot that's lost like I think there's a lot that's lost in all of those errors, theological errors of that period. And someone might say, well, Jesus can pay for the window. He's the richest, you know, he has all the money in the world. That's so right. He can, he can, you know, make that window put, be put back in an instant. Yes. But in this life, as we see, the window still is broken. Yes. There are still natural consequences to sin. Yes. And I, I, I find that when I when I help someone else with their consequence or I have to pay my own, even though Jesus forgives me, you know, I, I find that I learn, mm. I grow, I can become more virtuous that way. Mm. So in, in a sense, the consequence is a gift. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in a way, this touches on that philosophical point, the complicated mm. philosoph philosophical underpinning of the Protestant Catholic divide. You're, you're touching on something that mm. relates to that. Christ and God the Father, they love to use what we call instrumental causes so that you can be the instrumental cause by uh, participating in this exchange of spiritual goods. As you said, that's a gift for you to be able to help your brother or sister in Christ, right? He, he, he loves to use um, – sure, God could fix the window, but he loves the fact that I get to mow the lawn and help fix the window because there's something so sacramental about that, material about that, incarnational about mm -hmm. that. And really that's where that divide 
um, becomes most pronounced that Catholics and Orthodox, the ancient apostolic Christians understand the incarnation to have touched every facet of this life here below. We're not just trapped in our heads. We're not just thinking people trapped in our heads, but, but you, you know, again, using that limping analogy, my brother mowing the lawn so that I don't have to do it and that pays for the window is somehow so much more, um, so much more beautifully sharing in God's goodness as he pours that out to his children than if God were just to fix the window mm. miraculously without my brother mowing the lawn or my needing to mow the lawn to pay for it. That's so beautiful. So one more question on purgatory before we move on to our ghost topic okay. and trick-or-treating. Um, so if I, it, there's obviously the teaching in, of our Lord in the Bible about how he is the one mediator mm -hmm. ultimately, and he is the, he is the, you know, he is the path to salvation, Jesus Christ. Yes. And so this is obviously to the concern about praying to Mary, praying to saints, praying to the dead. I want to ask it one more time because I, I do think it's, it's a hard thing if you aren't, it's not, it's a cultural shock. You know, I don't mm -hmm. grow up this way. And I know for me, I didn't grow up this way with prayers. You can pray for the dead. They can pray for you. You can ask blessed mother for her prayers. I mean, that all of it as a Protestant girl for me was like this, I gotta, I gotta get to the bottom of this. And once I really studied it, um, I was persuaded, but you know, one of the objections is intercessors, mm. you know, yes, you can ask me to pray for you. I can pray for you in this life. But ultimately, Jesus Christ is the intercessor. Yes, absolutely. He is the one mediator between God and man, the God man, Jesus Christ. Christ is the mediator. Everything flows through him. He is the center of all things, and in him all things came to be, right? Again, this is about that beautiful instrumental causality that God loves to use amongst his created mm. universe. That, that power of intercessory prayer, the power of the intercession of the saints is about that uh, instrumental causes. So Christ is the mediator and our blessed mother leads us to him. She prays for us on our way to him. She is the, um, St. Bernard beautifully says that Christ is the fountain of the life-giving waters and our lady is the aqueduct mm. through which he comes. So there are these wonderful channels of all of that mediated grace, mediated by the power of the sacrifice of Christ. And those channels are each other. We are the channels one for another of the grace that comes from the mediating power of Jesus Christ through our blessed mother, through the saints in heaven, through each other here on earth, through the saints who are members of the church below. And again, you see how that's a philosophical problem? That if you understand how that instrumental causality, that is God loving to affect the things in his creation through the instruments whom he has created, makes all of those theological truths shine with their brightness. So hmm. so you said earlier on trick-or-treating that, yes, it, it's actually a, ultimately a Catholic tradition that, yes, of course, trick-or-treating is good. And I think maybe the person you're going to their home, they're not thinking, oh, I'm going to mm -hmm. give you a candy so you can pray for my dead. I wish they would. <laughs> but but it's a it's a practice that us Christians can do as we trick-or-treat is pray for the dead of the homes of the families that we meet. Yes, and and pray for Which, the and pray for the people who are living in those homes and too. Pray for the living you know, it's too. like an opportunity for Christian witness. <laughs> yes. So you know? so is it right then, you know, today the Halloween thing has gone crazy. Yes. There's obviously the scantily clad crazy co-ed type outfits on college campuses. There's that. But then there's also the for little kids, you can dress up as a as a you know obviously a ghost you can dress up as a witch mm -hmm. you can dress like there's devil outfits for mm -hmm. like babies basically yes. what do we think about that okay so it makes me uncomfortable okay so you're you're uncomfortable with a lot of things there i think lila you're uncomfortable with the fact that once again our post-christian secular culture has co-opted one of our christian things our catholic christian festivals and made it completely a materialistic sensual over over um materialized farce once again, like Valentine's Day, like Christmas is quickly careening toward that also. I do love sweet tarts. Yeah. <laughs> so there's some things that's like that material thing. Some of the material things are cute, but right. with Halloween, a lot of it's not cute. That's right. And so I don't think that we Catholic Christians or Christians in general, I don't think we should cave to the fact we shouldn't just let this go and say, because they've ruined it, 
we're not going to have anything to do with it. I think that we can try to reclaim the culture, at least in our own families and maybe in our church or parish communities by saying, we're going to restore as much as we can the Christian roots and the Christian flavor of these beautiful ancient festivals. And so I would say this, there, that um, don't let all of the um, weird, demonic, like scare value of the, of the things on the, on the face of it keep you from appreciating the depth of what can actually happen in, the, in these wonderful high holy days of our Christian liturgical year. Um, by the way, the whole thing about uh, masquerading and even dressing up as demons and, and ghouls and fiends, that's also, there's a place for that in, in ancient Christian life, in medieval Christian life. Really? Now, unfortunately, we don't live in a culture that makes sense of that. But if Christ is victorious over sin and death, then the demons are conquered. <laughs> and the medieval Christians in different parts of, of especially Western European Catholicism said that this is the perfect opportunity for us to thumb our noses at them. You dress up like a ghost or a goblin and you say, you see, you have no, you've got nothing on us because Christ is victorious over you. We're going to celebrate tomorrow the saints in heaven. And on the next day, November 2nd, we're going to pray for our beloved dead. So and it's you mocking can't, them. And you can't do anything about it. It's mocking them. It's mocking them in, in the way that a Catholic culture can make sense of it. Mm. There's still places where this happens, not only on Halloween. So in, in parts of Bavaria, before Lent begins, the, the culture has people dress up in kind of ghoulish masks and, and, and um, yeah, it's a masquerade with a parade and festivities and fun like Mardi Gras mm. in France or in New Orleans or in Brazil, all those places that have that kind of French um, root, the French roots. That, that happened at the beginning of Lent. As a, it's a wonderful way to let our hair down and party with some of the excesses of, of human life and fun in order to be able to pray well, mm. prepare well for the feast. And part of that is mocking the devil who's, who's a, again, figuratively, right? So the masquerading and the costumes don't have to be weird or creepy. Unfortunately, a secular culture doesn't understand any of that. So I don't know how we get that part back. Many, many um, fervent Catholic parishes have uh, adopted custom of, yeah, dress up in costumes. Kids love that. Dress up as the saints, you know? But you're and, saying it's okay to dress up as a witch or to put the devil ears on your baby. I think, uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think you, you should put so. on your baby. Okay. But, but I think that you can make <laughs> but sense. some little kids, I mean, they go You can to make the, sense yeah. even of that. You can make mm -hmm. sense even of that if you're in mm -hmm. a cultural atmosphere that makes sense of it. Mm. Like and we are mock together, we're mocking and we're celebrating the victory of death of, of of life over death of Christ over death. Yes. And so part of doing that is to dress up even as the goblins and the gremlins and the ghouls to say like you have no power. Yes. Now I don't. I again I wouldn't recommend that necessarily for a family. No. Every now, Catholic listening is like we're going to get our like, our ghoul costume on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think like I said, you can make sense of it culturally, mm -hmm. but unfortunately we don't live in a Catholic culture anymore. Right. So you have to you have to find a way to inc make these things incarnate and lived in family life or in parish life mm -hmm. or in church life in a way that's going to make sense now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, as I said, is about proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ in this particular atmosphere. So it might not be a great idea to put the, the devil horns on your little baby. I think that'd be kind of silly anyway. But like I said, mm. having, I, I remember as a kid, you know, growing up in a, in a very ordinary mm. Catholic parish and Catholic atmosphere. Um, it's not like that was Christendom, not by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, the Casper, the friendly ghost decorations and um, the skeletons and the skulls, there was a context for that in my mm. family and in my parish. We understood what that meant. It wasn't mm. scary for the kids. And it's also because we understood that to be referring both to the mockery of, of the conquered foe and also about the fact that death is on our mind. Mm -hmm. Death is on our mind in these days. And that's a good thing for Christians to think about. And to remember the dead. Memento mori. Remember Memento the dead. Mori. Remember the dead. So, remember your death. And mm -hmm. so the, 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 the talk of death and the decorations and things that make us remember death even those have a very important place in the Christian life. You're going to die. Are you ready for it? What about the people who have died? Were they ready for it? And so surrounding ourselves with those things, I would recommend, and you haven't asked about this yet, but I think especially for Catholic Christians, for Catholics, take your children to the cemetery and pray mm -hmm. for your beloved dead. It's a beautiful custom mm -hmm. and death should not be scary. It's a part of life. And it's okay to welcome children into in an appropriate way, in an age-appropriate way, 
helping them to understand that death is a part of their life too, of family life. I think that it's really sad that Catholics don't go to the cemeteries anymore. The church thinks it's so important that she blesses that with an indulgence. Wow. Visiting the cemetery in the octave of um, All Saints Day. And what does that mean? What When you say indulgence, what do you get? So, yeah, so the, the, <laughs> you go to it, the cemetery to pray for the dead. Yes, and there, the Catholics can can look this up online about how to how to find the you know what all of that means mm. if you don't know what that means. And um, there are many places you can find out what all of that means. Basically, it's an indulgence to act. Praying for the dead is a valuable and important thing, and you can gain uh, what we call a plenary indulgence for to be applied mm. to the souls of the faithful departed. Mm by visiting a cemetery and praying for the dead. And there's, again, that's, I'm oversimplifying that, but so your Protestant friends are, their heads might spin, <laughs> but that's there, okay. It's, there's, it's okay. There's so much beauty beauty to yeah. what you're saying though. And you know, as over the years I've come to understand it and live in it. And again, I think culture clashes, I think as significant as a philosophical question or disagreement, mm. because if you don't grow up with it, mm -hmm. Uh, culturally, it can feel very strange. Pray for the dead. You know, now most people do visit the cemetery mm -hmm. at least to remember. Yes, but to to remember and to pray yes. is the call for for Catholics and, and Orthodox, Absolutely. and I believe for all Christians. I believe too. Yes. So so now, what about ghosts? Okay. What are ghosts? Are they real? Um, not just should you dress up as one or not, but do we? You know, if there are some actual, I know as an exorcist, you know, there's demons are real, angels are real. But I've heard stories of people that really believe there was a ghost that they right. encountered or that they were scared of. So I think that the the Catholic uh, perspective on this and also the perspective of, I would say, the vast majority of exorcists on this would be that most of the time, those kind of supernatural experiences are attributed to one of two things, either some demonic presence that's manifesting itself mm -hmm. in that way or... And this is a different kind of manifestation of that. The souls of the faithful departed asking for prayers in some kind of manifest way. Uh, that's a little bit complicated and a little that might be too far afield for this conversation. But the so those two things. So, so if yeah. you if you there could be a soul that's not getting prayers and he might come knocking. Yes, correct. Like knock knocking. <laughs> Correct. That's wow. that. There, that that is a possibility, mm. and um, I could tell a beautiful, fun little story from the Orthodox world about that, which was reported to me. So this is about you know this is a story that comes at third or fourth hand now, but the the priest who uh, was a drunkard, and um, he he was struggling in his priestly life as an Orthodox priest to maintain kind of the integrity of his own Christian life. And, but he was repentant and he was a struggler and he was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful struggler. And he could celebrate the prayers in the Orthodox Church for the faithful departed. That's what he was doing, offering the, the divine liturgy for that intention. That's pretty much all he did. Mm -hmm. And his bishop was um, really irritated with his drunkenness and how that was a public scandal and so forth. And so he he um, wanted to remove the ability of this priest to say those prayers and to offer those liturgies. And the, the bishop was awakened one night by this crowd of ghosts, that is souls of the souls of the faithful departed, who were chastising him in the night, don't remove this priest's faculties to be able to offer these prayers because we need them. Wow. And even though he's a drunkard, at least he's praying for us. <laughs> you know? so, wow. so that's a, just a, a fun little story about 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 how that the world between the beyond that veil that liminal veil between this world and the next is sometimes a is sometimes perforated mm. and we have communication across it and that's a beautiful and mysterious thing so a non demonic ghost is not a scary thing at all it's a it's okay. a soul that really just needs a prayer that's right I, uh, a bit of an over, oversimplification but mm. yes in a nutshell that's right and if you are, so I've had dreams in the past as an example, or felt strong, a strong impulse to pray for someone who had passed that I had not thought of in years mm -hmm. or who I didn't have any kind of close connection to and dreams where this person would be in my dream. Mm -hmm. And the sense of it was they were asking for mm -hmm. something from me. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, and I've heard other people express similar things, it's a, it's prayer that they're seeking. I think so. And why wouldn't, why wouldn't God allow that communication to happen in our dream life. Mm. 
again, it's difficult for us to interpret those things in some of kind course. of a concrete. It's not like a it's not like a checklist that you can check off all of the factors and say, oh, that was definitely this person asking for prayers. But why not? Mm -hmm. And I would say that if you were inspired to pray and you did, there's nothing bad about that. But and that's nothing but good about that. Mm -hmm. And that can't come from the evil one because he doesn't want us to pray. That's true. Babies deserve the best, and that's why everylife.com was created. Everylife.com is creating premier, ethically sourced, best-in-class baby products for our little ones. That's diapers and wipes for your precious little one, and this, everylife.com, is a pro-life company. When you buy at everylife.com, you know you're supporting a company that, unlike Pampers or Huggies or any of the competitors, don't support your values everylife.com does support your values. I love Every Life because they're giving part of their money back to the pro-life movement to support the fight to save babies. So go to everylife.com today. You can order your diapers and wipes. You can become a subscriber and you can use the code LILA10 at checkout for 10% off your order. All right. So for those listening that want to celebrate, okay. that already are celebrating, you already mentioned the beauty and the grace of going to pray in a, at a cemetery with your family and your children mm -hmm. for the dead. Trick or treating's okay. It's got the got the thumbs up, but pray for those in the home and pray for the dead of the home. Yes. As you do that, what are some other things that okay, so, Christians can do during this the, these those upcoming holy days? Upcoming holy days. I think the trick or treating thing. You know, I've heard all kinds of fun and creative solutions to this. A neighborhood that you know is safe. A neighborhood that you know might be. Um, not quite so marked by all of those awful, um, you know, skeletons in the yard and so forth, the, the, the really over materialized thing. There's the trunk or treating. That seems a, I don't know if you've heard about that, you know, in the parish, in the parish um, parking lot or something, a little bit more of a controlled environment. I think that especially for Catholic Christians, encouraging the people in your parish to put together a little party for the kids. Why not? Let them dress up, dress up as the saints, you know, maybe have a parade you know, all of that kind of making our faith tangible and fun and culturally rich, that's a great thing to do. That's all Halloween related, the eve, the eve of All Saints. All Saints Day, go to Holy Mass. It's a holy day of obligation. Mm -hmm. Celebrate the fact that we have this cloud of witnesses surrounding us who are praying for us, all of our friends in heaven who have arrived at the heavenly homeland. That's what All Saints Day is about. And when the saints go marching in, as it were, you know, celebrating that um, triumph of Christ's victory in their lives, there are far more, far more members of the church in heaven than there are on earth. You think so? Absolutely. That's encouraging. You think of all the people who are alive I, right I now? I think so too, but absolutely. How many are we're, not we're the minority? In, how many you know? are not in heaven? How do we know? Do we have <laughs> we any sense? We don't have any. Okay. We don't. We can't know that. No, we, we just can't know. because there have been billions of souls. Exactly. Before us. Exactly. We are the we are the minority, and the majority mm -hmm. are are of members of the church are the deceased members of the church. If either. someone died in three hundred A.D., yes, is are are they for sure through purgatory by now? <laughs> I sure hope so, Lila. That's a question about time, and I don't know those. These are these are things I can't know. Okay. We can't know, you know, how long is a soul in purgatory? What does that mean? And of course, time is the measurement of change according to before and after. Um, that's what time is. And so, before and after is a, those are those are important factors in how we reckon time. So, do most people go to purgatory? Would you say I would? Well, okay. So, they uh, need a purgation process to complete. We their know sanctification. that that nothing impure enters heaven that who is in heaven right now, the God, obviously, and all of the angels and all of the saints. Who else is in heaven? Is, is, is grandma in heaven? Well, was she a saint, demonstrably a saint before she died? Then yes, maybe the church probably won't. Uh, certainly the church can't canonize everybody who's in heaven right now. Uh, if someone is not a saint that is purified, ready to see, to behold the face of Christ, free from all stain of sin and all the temporal punishment due to their sin, then they're going to be in purgatory. I think I, I might have mentioned this last time we mm -hmm. talked, but the ordinary path for every Catholic Christian, for every Christian, is that we cooperate with God's grace. We're saved, obviously, washed in the blood of the land, baptized, cooperate with God's grace so that we become saints on earth before we die. That's the ordinary path. So if there's no purgatory If we don't needed. put up, that's not the, it's, it's not, the ideal situation would be that we're sanctified 
because of all the many, many gifts that our Lord gives us in order to become his closest friends, to become saints, and we die and go to heaven. Whether or not that happens has everything to do with us. I've heard that it's much harder to be purified in purgatory than on earth. Because we can't, because the souls in purgatory, we call them the, the poor souls in Catholic lingo or the holy souls. They can't do anything for themselves because they don't have their bodies with them. They're waiting the resurrection of the body. Their, their time of, uh, of merit is over. Death brings an end to the possibility to, to grow closer to the Lord in that way. And so they can do nothing for themselves, which is why it's so important to pray for them. They're the neediest mm -hmm. souls in the mystical body of Christ. They are the poorest of the poor. Our prayers are the only things that can help. And masses for Catholics, half masses said for the dead. That's what helps speed their purification. And they are, they are so grateful. Imagine if we have all of these intercessors in heaven now, the St. Augustines and the St. Monica's and the St. Norbert's and our blessed mother, Imagine the souls that arrive at heaven because of our prayers helped helping their purification, how they will be our friends hmm. interceding for us. So. so in the process of sanctification on this earth to avoid purgatory, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think you weren't though, I know I'm, I'm going a direction here about saints, but was there something else you wanted to say about ways we can celebrate all saints and all souls? Okay. And then I want to finish this out with the topic of saints. Okay. The positive Good. topic yeah, of saints. Yeah, that's great. So I, I mentioned, you know, the, the, the trappings and the fun and the festivity and the tomfoolery around the vigil of all saints. That's a very Catholic thing. Um, Carving pumpkins and lighting candles and all of that. Where did the carving of the pumpkin come? Like, from? and that has to do with the with the visiting of the cemeteries, preparing to visit the cemeteries the next day, and mocking the demons and carrying candles and wow. and all of that. That that those are all the cultural features that go along with that. Those customs of preparing to go to the cemetery and then going to the cemetery. That's all around that. So All Saints Day, go to Holy Mass, celebrate with your family, uh, celebrate with your parish community, and. And then beginning on All Saints Day, but certainly on All Souls Day, visit the cemetery, pray for the dead, that you can do that for a whole octave and through the month of November. November is the month of the dead. So those are all suggestions about how to sprinkle holy water on the graves of your of your of your loved ones. Um, priests do that. We go and bless the, the cemeteries in on All Souls Day. Those are suggestions about how to celebrate. And then you asked. The saints. So, okay. and, and there's a few things here, and then we'll, and then I'll let you go because I know you're on to on to the next thing. But on the topic of saints and you know the process of sanctification in this life, and you said earlier the goal is to go straight to heaven. The goal is yes. to be sanctified in this life. Yes. To allow yourself to be sanctified by the graces of of God and and all the graces that He gives us through all the different means that He gives us grace. But some of us end up in purgatory. What's the and you said there's a lot of saints, though, in heaven. You think that there's many more than there are on, or on earth. Is there anything more you can share? I know there's different mm -hmm. saints over the years that have mm -hmm. had revelations about how there's actually a ton of people in hell mm -hmm. and, you know, the concerns about people that just blow off this opportunity in this life. And if you get to purgatory, it is a lot harder than this earth. You said there's suffering souls, and that's because on this earth, uh, you say you have your, you have your body, but there's additional physical, I mean, I don't know if it's physical, but certainly spiritual pain that they're mm -hmm. feeling in purgatory. Yes. What more can we know about the process of saint making. Okay, so um, it definitely it. makes me convicted because it's like I've got this one day. I know I have. I might die tomorrow, so better make it count. Yes, I agree, and I think that's the point about all of that thinking about well, how many souls are damned and how many souls are saved. It, it that's a scary thing to think about, but it's motivating. We we learn from the Book of Revelation that our Lord doesn't want us to be lukewarm the lukewarm he spits out of his mouth. He'd rather we be hot or cold, right? We want to be hot with the fire of charity, don't we? We want to be on fire with love for Jesus Christ. And if we think that that it's not an automatic thing that everybody just because, because they call themselves a Christian means that they're going to be saved and sanctified and in heaven, if that's at least a possibility that, you know what? This is about the integrity of my Christian life and allowing my life to be transformed into a living icon of my Savior, Jesus Christ, vessel of the Holy Trinity filled with sanctifying grace. 
a member of his mystical body, all of those beautiful things that are true because of the life of grace, then that means I'm not going to compromise with this world or I'm not going to allow myself to settle into a kind of lukewarmness, right? So it's motivating. And I, I, I back away from, well, how many is it damned? How many is it saved? How many is it in purgatory? I think we need to we need to think about that more as what does that inspire me to do with my Christian life today? As you said, mm -hmm. this might be your last day on earth. I pray to God that it's not. Mm -hmm. You have too much good work to do. Mm -hmm. But we don't know when God is going to call us home. I would say, so the process of sanctification then, I just want to, one thing that occurs to me about that is that embracing all of the, sa the sacrifices and suffering that come with our state in life, you as a wife and a mother, mm -hmm me as a consecrated religious and a priest, everybody out there, all of our friends out there, your life carries with it a lot of purification. If we embrace that and offer it, offer it back to our Lord and say, Lord, help this. Let me let this suffering sanctify me and purify, help to purify the souls in purgatory. It's to offer it up. In Catholic life, we, we, those of us who are raised in Catholic households, our mothers always told us, when you you know you stub your toe or you're or you're feeling ill or you're feeling under the weather whatever offer it up yeah. offer it up offer up that suffering as a pleasing sacrifice to god for your own sanctification and for the suffer the suck, the sucker of the souls in purgatory so and so if there's you know when we pray for all souls day and obviously we celebrate all saints day we don't know for sure except for the canonized catholic saints correct we don't know for sure who's where correct so in a way we're kind of, there's a bit of a guessing in terms of Correct. we're going to pray for the soul of this person, but they might not, they might be in hell already. Is I, that I, possible? It is possible. Certainly it's possible that hell is a real possibility and please God, none of us finds him or herself there. Can you imagine? No, you can't even imagine. The thing that but, comforts me about hell is we choose to go there. Yes. You got to choose it. Yes. We have to choose it deliberately, choose not to be on the side of Christ and his church. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think I, I sometimes think that just to your to your mm -hmm. question there about we since we can't know except for those saints whom the church has canonized and tells us these are saints who are worthy of our veneration and our intercept we can ask for their intercession liturgically speaking they've been mm -hmm. elevated to the altars as we say it's always as especially as a Catholic priest it makes me very anxious when people at the funeral say well grandma's already in heaven we know for sure she's in heaven I'm like well how do you know she's in heaven what if she's in purgatory and she needs your prayers yeah. the point there is don't stop praying for your beloved dead because mm. you don't know where they are just because we're good doesn't mean that we're sanctified <laughs> so if, you know, if he was a good man she was a good man oh they were nice if grandma or great grandma dies and your young child asks you where are they? Mm -hmm. Can you say they're in heaven or we hope they're in heaven? I mean, that we can say we, certainly, less... certainly we hope they're in heaven. We say they are in the hands of almighty God. They so are in the hands of Jesus Christ. Jesus. They're, they're with Jesus in the sense that they are with his plan for them. Mm -hmm. And, and every soul who's in purgatory is going to be in heaven when the time mm -hmm. of purification is over. So they are with God. That might mean that they are still in purgatory undergoing their purification. Mm -hmm. That might mean that they're rejoicing with the angels and saints on high. And I think you can tell your children, they are safely in God's hands. Mm -hmm. If they died a good and holy death, they're safely in God's hands. And we're going to keep praying for them. There are um, deceased members of my own religious community whom I love. They're, they're my brothers. They're my brothers in religion. They're my brothers in the priesthood. And I like to pray. There's one in particular I pray to and four, often both, two and four, because I say, I don't know if you are in heaven or in purgatory. If you're in purgatory, I'm praying for you right now, and <laughs> I really hope you get there soon through my prayers and through my sacrifices for you and so forth. And if you're in heaven, please pray for me mm. for this particular intention. Mm. So I don't know. The jury's out. Mm. We know for some, and that's the canonized, so who we celebrate on All Saints Day is yes. the ones that we know know. You know, they're canonized by the church. That's and we also, and we, sorry to interrupt, yeah. Lila. Please we do. also celebrate all of those who are not known to us. Hmm. So that is on All Saints Day, we are also celebrating for our grandparents, great-grandparents, all of those who very likely could be in heaven, but we just don't know because the church hasn't canonized them. So we're celebrating all the saints in heaven, even those who are unknown.
Does that make sense? Can It does make sense. Can you share a little bit about this canonization process? <laughs> yes. I've heard a lot of different things from different folks over the years. You know, this is getting in the weeds, but I think it's really valuable yes. because there's some that criticize the whole thing. You know, how can you know? Or they say, of course, every Christian who passes is in heaven automatically. So they want to discount purgatory. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like, you know, are you putting them on a pedestal? Why would you do that? And then also, how do we know in the process of of the church's diligence, due diligence, that it act they actually are in heaven? Okay. In addition, I'm going to ask you about the change in the canonization process. Okay in the last few decades. Okay. I think it was under Pope John Paul II. I think that's right. And I'm, I'm not an expert in those changes, but the, in a nutshell, the, the church uh, elevates for the example of the whole body of Christ, those individuals whom she wants to share, show them as models to follow in some particular way. And usually those people, those holy people who have uh, what we call a liturgical cult, that is there are groups of people through the centuries who have honored them in some kind of a public and important way. So the early saints um, mm -hmm. before the 12th century, if I'm not mistaken, they were usually those saints who, those people who, whom the church had lifted up in some kind of a concrete way locally, you know, in a diocese of North Africa or in France, particular people where they were so obviously holy, the church began to venerate them in this, in this kind of a way. And then the church ratified that with a liturgical cult saying you can offer mass in their honor. You can say the, the divine office in their honor. You can pray to them in, with these prayers and the church blesses all of that. And then, then there's the process that began that's a more kind of juridical process to say, well, there's so, the church has spread so far around the whole world. How can we kind of regulate this in a more systematic way? And that's the process for canonization, which was then adopted by the church, which involves examining their lives, um, the, the virtues of their lives. It in involves the recognition of miracles that are uh, favors that are granted through their intercessory power. And that's that's probably what you're talking about is controversial, mm -hmm. but, but two miracles necessary identified by the church and carefully studied. So that is, we're definitely in the tall grass here. And they need scientific proof for them too, right? They for do. These, these have to be miracles that are physical. Or can they be um, spiritual healing? Usually spirit? they're physical, but okay. that not, that's not exclusively necessary. So that's a very complicated question. But yes, there, there are some astonishing miracles through the intercessory power of the saints. So should one want to be a canonized saint? I think we should all strive for holiness. We should mm -hmm. all strive to be saints because that means that we're just doing what what Christ and his church has given us the power to do, and that is to conform our lives to, to Christ so that mm. it's no longer I live, but Christ who lives within me as St. Paul says, we should all desire that so ardently that all we want is to become saints and to be with, with our Savior in heaven. But I think about St. Therese, you yes. know, she had this, this she's the little, uh, a little Carmelite sister who wanted so badly to be a saint and she had very physical limitations and she dreamed of these like, you know, incredible journeys to save souls and go in every continent and do all these amazing things. But she contented herself remembering that God made her as she was and she yes. in heaven could perhaps do the great feats of soul supporting and, and helping while she was a saint in heaven. But you kind of want to be known that you're a saint in heaven so that you can people, you know, you can have a relation that relationship to encourage them in their life on earth. And I, I and I also, you know, if you're a saint in heaven and you're not canonized on earth yet, are you helping the people canon who's who are can working on your canonization process? I think that if you're I think that we should want God's will to be affected in our lives so perfectly that if he desires that you, Lila, become a canonized saint <laughs> and an example for the church, that, that, that his will be done. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should have a whole lot to say about that for ourselves mm -hmm. personally. I, I would, you know, St. Therese, she did say that she, did, she wants to spend her heaven doing good on earth. Mm -hmm. She would be doing that whether she were canonized or not. Mm -hmm. And I think all the saints in heaven, whether they're canonized or not, that is whether they're elevated by the church as an example, like look to this one, pray to this one, ask this one for those favors. So we can do, as a saint in heaven, we can do as much good on earth regardless of our canonization. All according that's not to God's holy will. That's not going to affect necessarily our relationship with other people. I, I think that's if true. We, if we make it. All of these mm -hmm. things, all of these things are all up to God's good pleasure. Mm -hmm. He is the Lord of the universe. He's the one who determines which individual people become the canonized saints that are elevated by the church. He determines the ones who are in heaven right now, unknown to anybody, but whose intercessory power is making, keeping, keeping the, the 
Earth going around the sun. But I've noticed too, there's a lot of human will that he works through, of course, and he permits. Instrumental causality. Instrumental causality in the saint making process. Yes. And I've talked to some of these guys who are talking about, you know, as an example, there's Mother Angelica, right? Who's not sainted yet. And there's these other, you know, um, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, Sheen and yes. there, you know, J.K. Chesterton. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, people have their favorite. They really want them for multiple reasons to be canonized. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's the little known soul, you know, mm -hmm. the father of seven, eight, nine children who had a very quiet life. And, you know, someone maybe has the imagination to strike up his cause. It's all yes. in his providence, of course. It's all in his providence. And, and it's he all... probably works through people's absolutely good and maybe not so good intentions along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that you just I couldn't agree with you more that God's providence descends even to all of those individual circumstantial decisions along the, the process of canonization or the publication mm -hmm. of books or all of those things. All of that is guided by God's marvelous providential care. And we'll only see how that all works out once we get to heaven and we mm -hmm. see, oh, now I understand why you use that person's desire for whatever to make this canonization process go along here. Mm -hmm. And we'll see it all. That's mm -hmm. gonna be one of the marvelous joys of heaven to see all of the threads of the tapestry, how they all work together. Hmm. And it's only how many saints are canonized? We don't have oh, that Oh gosh, many. I don't even know. That's it's, a great it's question. It's not much more than a thousand as I No, I think it's, I, I think it's much, it much more, more than a thousand. Is it much more? It's much more than a thousand. It would be okay. many thousands. Okay. We read in the martyrology of the church in my monastery. Oh, there's we the read. martyrs, yeah. So yeah. so every, it's, it's a long, long list, beautiful, long, And if long you're list. a martyr, you are, go right to heaven. Correct. That's correct. That that's mm -hmm. uh, that's the that's the the um, short shortcut. You know, <laughs> the quick path, the fast like the path. tough, the tough and quick one. Okay, last question on saints. You said, yeah, I, I don't necessarily know all the details of what happened during this time, but John Paul II did mm -hmm. do uh, some changes in the canonization process. And he my streamlined it. Yes, my understanding of it in part was to shorten the time before someone uh, can be canonized. Meaning. You know, there was maybe decades would pass or even hundreds of years before yes. someone would be canonized up after their death. And he was saying, no, it, it can be less time. So we have more modern saints. Yes. And then he seemed to put an, an additional emphasis not on the religious being canonized, but on lay people being canonized, including children. I mean, teenagers, Blessed married Carla couples. Blessed Carla Cutis, for example, recently, the, just a couple of years ago, a wonderful Italian young man who's, whose body is in Assisi in Italy in his hoodie with his with his soccer cleats on and I don't know if they're cleats but is he incorrupt he's also incorrupt that's and what a whole does other that world mean? You're, yeah. You're so, yeah that means that his his flesh is not decaying yeah. um, so that's a whole other wonderful world that often makes our Protestant friends heads spin mm -hmm. but again it's about the incarnational reality of the Christian life that sometimes God God preserves the body of the deceased person on earth mm -hmm. from the corruption of death Saint Bernadette Saint Blessed Carla Cutis, St. Padre Pio, there are many, there, there are many incorrupt saints. Their bodies are not rotting in the, in the tomb, but you can go and look at them. It's, yeah. It's so amazing. The Catholic world is beautiful. To your point there about mm -hmm. the, there was an expedi expedition of the canonization process precisely mm -hmm. so that um, John Paul II, Pope St. John Paul II wanted to lift up some contemporary witnesses for us to look to and including lay people. It's not just for priests and consecrated religious, but holiness is for everybody. Everybody is called to holiness. Everyone's so. called to be a saint. Correct. Wonderful. Well, Father, what are you doing to celebrate the Holy Days coming up? Well, Halloween and All Saints and All Souls Day. For us, uh, consecrated religious and for priests, the liturgical life is supreme for us. So we'll begin our celebration of All Saints Day at the vigil. The the High Holy Days begin the evening before. And so for us, Halloween begins with first Vespers of All Saints Day. And of course, a very solemn mass on All Saints Day. One of the great joys of priestly life is offering masses for the dead. So All mm -hmm. Souls Day, uniquely, well, there are two days of the year that the priests can offer three masses in one day for the souls of the faithful departed. So we celebrate many masses on All Souls Day. And I often like to think, uh, and of course, we visit cemeteries. We bless the graves of our beloved dead and of our confreres. I often like to think that um, I pray that every November 2nd is like Christmas in purgatory. Mm. And that mm. I always have this, this intention in my, in my mind that with our masses and the, the masses happening all over the world, the sacrifices of the mass that the priests are offering, three each 
all around the the universal church that purgatory is emptied on all souls day every wow, year <laughs> so beautiful we'll see if that happens i love that but no trick-or-treating for you no trick-or-treating no and you've got your costume already i've so you're I've, all you're I all live set in, to i live go. in my halloween costume <laughs> <Lila>. <laughs> well it's a good one i might try to make one for my my four-year-old so <laughs> my almost Great. four-year-old <laughs> thank you so much father ambrose this has been awesome thanks lila god bless you and your viewers thank you Thanks for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast with Father Ambrose Christ. Don't forget to like this video if you are on YouTube, to leave a comment, to subscribe to the channel, and if you're on podcast app, to subscribe to the podcast. Share it with a friend, leave us a review. That will help the podcast reach more people. Also, we have our Patreon. Our Patreon is a growing community of people that are going to be getting behind the scenes access and special updates about the show. You can check out Patreon Patreon at the link in the bio and become a monthly supporter of the Lila Rose podcast there. We'll see you guys next time.